Well, thank you, and it's very good to be here again at Temenos. The science delusion is the belief that science already understands the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. And within modern science, there's a conflict between the ideal of scientific inquiry, uh, which is free inquiry, uh, questioning dogmas, skepticism, uh, empirical evidence, uh, and, and so on, and the so-called scientific worldview, which is essentially the materialist philosophy, which has dominated institutional science since the late 19th century. The materialist ideology or worldview or the series of assumptions that it makes up are more or less taken for granted by scientists. You're not told about them. You're not, as an, while you're being educated as a scientist, no one says, here are these assumptions, here's the evidence for them. They're just implicit. You absorb them by a kind of intellectual osmosis. And so, at an extra remove, does almost everybody who has a university education or even a sixth form education. They're the basic assumptions of secular, modern secular society. And somehow they're assumed ultimately to be the truths about nature guaranteed by science. Essentially, this worldview tells us that all reality is material or physical that the world's a machine made out of inanimate matter, that nature is purposeless and evolution has no purpose or direction, that consciousness is nothing but the activity of the brain, and that um, God is simply an idea in human minds and hence in human brains. And this is the world view which is simply taken for granted. And when I was being educated as a scientist, I accepted it completely. It was part of the package deal. If you're a scientist, this is the default position you adopt. It took me a long time to realize that this is based on a whole series of assumptions um, and uh, that I didn't realize were assumptions to start with. I just thought they were the truth. And most scientists do think they're the truth. What I'm doing in this book, The Science Delusion, is to take the 10 central dogmas of science and turn them into questions and look at them scientifically to see whether they hold up as scientific questions. What I'm doing is taking the ideal of science, which is very widely believed in, especially by non-scientists. Um, most scientists know that it's not really like that, but there's a kind of naive belief in science which is very widespread among followers of what one could call scientism, people who've turned science into a belief system or even a religion. And here's a, a clear statement of this ideal. It's treated not as an ideal, but as a fact, by Ricky Gervais, the comedian, who had a, a column in the Wall Street Journal just before Christmas in 2010, in which he explained his atheist worldview. He contrasted the superstition and dogmatism of religion uh, with the, the nature of science. And he said, science seeks the truth, and it does not discriminate. For better or worse, it finds things out. Science is humble. It knows what it knows and it knows what it doesn't know. It bases its conclusions and beliefs on hard evidence, evidence that is constantly updated and upgraded. It doesn't get offended when new facts come along. It embraces the body of knowledge. Well, anyone who's worked in a science lab or argued with a materialist will know that it's not quite as simple as that. But I'm going to take this ideal as the operating principle for this quest and actually look at the assumptions of science as if they are things that are open to question and evidence. The first of them is the dogma that nature is essentially mechanical. Everything in nature is essentially mechanical. And when turned into a question, this becomes, is nature mechanical? Now, it really helps to see the history of those ideas, and I'm just going to give a very brief thumbnail history of this basic proposition, because it's the most fundamental proposition in modern science. It's the central assumption that dominated modern science from the 17th century. And the scientific revolution of the 17th century was essentially uh, the revolution that turned our view of nature into machinery. Before that, what they were rebelling against, what they were reacting against, 
was the view taught in the medieval universities and universally believed in Europe that nature was organic and alive, that we lived in a living universe, the living God was the live, God of a living world, that animals and plants were truly organisms with their own souls. Um, the souls of plants shaped the form of the plant. The animals uh, had souls that shaped their form and in addition, the animal soul that underlay instinct, sensitivity and movement. The word animal, of course, comes from the word anima, meaning soul. And humans, the human soul, uh, shared with plants the ability to shape the body, mold the body as it developed and maintain the health of the body. Uh, our animal soul gave us our animal nature and instincts which we share with the animals. Uh, the need for food, hunger, thirst, reproduction and so forth. Um, but the rational soul uh, was that part of the human soul which was open to the divine and was to do with thought, reason uh, and that which took us beyond uh, our mere animal nature. So that was the general belief that we lived in a living world made up of organisms that organized themselves. And according to Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, that meant that as well as having material bodies and depending on energy, uh, what he called the efficient cause, uh, Aquinas and Aristotle, the moving cause, um, that, that the soul of the animals and plants contained their purpose, which drew them towards uh, their developed form, if they were an embryo, or which uh, underlay their, underlay their instincts, and also gave them their form. It was the formal cause and the final cause of the animals and plants, and of everything in nature. What the mechanistic revolution did was said that living organisms and the whole world are not organisms with their own purposes and goals, as everyone had assumed. They were machines made up of parts, but the purposes and goals were external to the machinery. You see, what makes a machine different from an organism is that an organism has its own goals and purposes. A machine doesn't. It's made, designed, and created by human beings to fulfill human purposes. Machines have no purposes of their own. They have no designs of their own. They're designed by designers. They're made in factories, and they have uh, no purpose except what's given to them. Even a guided missile doesn't have a purpose of its own where it's going to be guided to. That has to be programmed in. And you see the difference clearly between, uh, with a car and a horse. If you get into a car, it'll go wherever you want it to go. It has no desire of its own. A horse might, on the other hand. <laughs> and and <coughs> so what in the 17th century scientists thought they were doing was enhancing uh, the arguments for the existence of God. All the founding fathers of modern science, people like Copernicus, Galileo, uh, Descartes, Newton, uh, Robert Boyle, uh, and so on, all, all the founding fathers were Christians. And they believed that by saying that the universe was a machine and everything in nature was a machine, they gave God more power, because God was now that which gave everything its purpose, its goal, and its design. He was the intelligent designer of everything in nature. Previously, uh, organisms had been seen as spontaneously organizing themselves and reproducing themselves. So God had this enhanced role. And um, what Descartes did in his, he, as the proponent of the mechanistic theory or mechanistic philosophy, or mechanical philosophy as it was called at the time, was to remove the souls from the whole of nature, leaving only the machinery and placing the purposes and designs outside nature in the mind of God, in the angels and in human minds. These were spiritual realities separate and, and distinct from matter. Matter was unconscious. It was uh, organized by designs and purposes that came from outside nature, uh, in, from the divine and the spiritual realm. Only humans had purposes and minds. Animals became just machines. Therefore, it was fine to vivisect them. Uh, and this way of thinking, when extrapolated way beyond anything Descartes could have imagined, leads to factory farming and modern agribusiness. So this view of nature as mechanical was at first not atheistic. In fact, it was theistic, but it created a new kind of theology, a mechanistic theology, and an image of God as an engineer, a mathematician, uh, and in fact, a God in the image of human beings uh, at the beginning of what became the Industrial Revolution. 
Um, so God was an engineer and a mathematician. But the machine's only a metaphor. This didn't prove organisms were just machines, it assumed it. Um, and in many ways, as we keep coming back to this in biology, it's better to think of organisms as organisms. Um, and it, the, the machine theory of life and the machine theory of nature is not something you can prove by experiment or test by, uh, in, in an experimental test. It's simply an assumption. It's a metaphor. And organisms are much better metaphors uh, for living organisms. In fact, they're not really metaphors. It's just saying what they are. Um, and even the whole universe is best thought of as an organism rather than a machine. One of the first people to point this out very clearly was none other than David Hume, who's remembered today for his famous scepticism about religion. But Hume was equally sceptical about the mechanistic theory of nature, implying as it did the need for a designer uh, uh, and something that gave it purpose outside itself. He suggested instead of the world being a machine created by a clockwork making God, um, it, was, it could have originated from something like a seed or an egg. This is what Hume said in his dialogues on um, natural religion. There are other parts of the universe, besides the machi machines of human invention, which bear still a greater resemblance to the fa fabric of the world, and which therefore afford a better conjecture concerning the universal origin of the system. These parts are animals and plants. The world plainly resembles more an animal or a vegetable than it does a watch or a knitting loom. And does not a plant or an animal which springs from vegetation or generation bear a stronger resemblance to the world than does any artificial machine which arises from reason and design? Well, Hume was surprisingly prescient because the idea that the world originates from something like an egg or a seed, that it's generated, is exactly what the modern cosmology since the 1960s tells us. The Big Bang Theory says the universe started very small uh, and it's been cooling and growing ever since and new structures have appeared within it. It's much more like a developing organism than a machine. The 19th century view of the universe as a mechanical system that was gradually running out of steam has just simply been superseded entirely by this modern cosmology. And in fact, the first proponent of the Big Bang Theory, Father George Lemaitre, a Roman Catholic priest and a cosmologist in the 1920s, thought of it as being like the hatching of the cosmic egg. And it is a very organic view of nature. At first, the Big Bang Theory was opposed by most scientists because they thought it was a Christian conspiracy to get back a creation and hence a creator. Um, um, but the evidence became overwhelming that the universe is expanding and the Big Bang Theory is now totally orthodox. So the idea that nature is mechanical is just an assumption, it's just a metaphor and there's no reason that we should think, lock all our thinking into one metaphor, a metaphor that's based on projecting our modern human obsession with machinery onto the whole of nature. It makes more sense to think of nature as organic uh, and organisms as organisms. Another consequence of this view was the second dogma of science. All matter is unconscious. This becomes the question, is matter unconscious? Well, for Descartes and the mechanistic uh, founders of science, matter was defined as unconscious. Um, that was what was unconscious. Consciousness was uh, separated off from matter, so it existed only in human minds, angels, and God. It was, the rest of nature was totally unconscious, um, made up of matter that was just pushed around by external forces. So this was a dualistic view, and that dualistic view dominated science up until the 19th century. But Increasingly, in the 19th century, many people hated the idea there were two things, two quite different things, matter and spirit, or matter and mind. And lots of people wanted there to be just one. They thought two was too many. Personally, I think two is too few. Um, but uh, those who thought two were too many uh, went in one of two directions. Either it's all matter, and the mind doesn't really exist, it's a kind of illusion that just exists in human brains, or it's all consciousness, 
in which case matter just arises somehow from a universal mind. Now that view is familiar in Eastern philosophy and was of course put forward in, um, in British philosophy by Bishop Berkeley. Um, but those two views, either idealism or materialism, uh, are both inadequate. But nevertheless, materialism came to dominate science. No one could prove what the human mind was. You couldn't weigh it, you couldn't put it in a test tube. Uh, and it was simply assumed it didn't exist. So all matter became unconscious. But then that creates the terrible problem of explaining how is it that we're conscious? We've got brains, uh, but if our brains are conscious, how can they be conscious if matter's unconscious? And this is what's called in the philosophy of mind the hard problem. The very existence of consciousness doesn't fit with materialism. And materialists have done all sorts of things to try and explain it away as an illusion, an epiphenomenon, just a way of talking about brain activity. But none of these materialist uh, theories are very convincing even to other materialists, which is why there are so many of them. Um, so um, the idea that mass unconscious runs up into a terrible problem in relation to the fact we're conscious. We may uh, say that animals are conscious too, or we may deny a consciousness to animals, but at least humans are conscious, undeniably. So how do we deal with it? Just to say it's nothing but the brain is what Francis Crick called the astonishing hypothesis. It's a claim that our minds are nothing but the physical activity of our brains, that our minds are nothing but genetically programmed computers, uh, the software of genetically programmed computers inside our heads. We ourselves are lumbering robots, in Richard Dawkins' vivid phrase. Um, and so uh, this, and of course we have no free will, because free will would imply something that's able to choose, the mechanism can't choose. Now this is a literally incredible point of view and it's amazing how many intelligent, educated people are prepared to defend it. But of course they always make an exception for themselves because otherwise uh, they're only spouting materialist theories because they're genetically or socially programmed to do so. They have no free choice in the matter according to their own <laughs> philosophy. Um, so it's a kind of self-refuting hypothesis and people argue for it very cleverly and then as soon as they've finished arguing for it, they revert to the ordinary common sense point of view, that they do have some measure of freedom, their mind's not just their brain, and so forth. So it's, first, it's literally incredible. Um, and some philosophers in the materialist camp have finally come to the conclusion that this just won't do. And the most eminent who put forward this view recently is Galen Strawson. Um, and Galen Strawson argues in a, in a recent paper in the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, called Does Materialism Imply Panpsychism? He argued that you can't really get consciousness from something that's intrinsically unconscious like this mechanistic view of matter. There has to be some level of consciousness even in the simplest material systems like electrons or atoms. Um, well, this was uh, greeted with howls of protest from the materialist philosophy world, but he stood his ground. And this is now, surprisingly, uh, a big debate in the realms of academic, materialist, atheistic philosophy. Um, but the idea that there's a kind of consciousness in all matter is not a new idea. It's what Aristotle believed. Uh, he believed that matter was shaped by forms, um, that matter was a potentiality that was shaped uh, in all beings, by souls, uh, in all living beings. Uh, it's what St. Thomas Aquinas thought too. Um, and after Descartes, there was already a reaction in the 17th century against this kind of extreme dualism. Leibniz, a contemporary of Newton's and who uh, invented the calculus independently of Newton, um, was convinced that matter was made up of what he called monads, which had both bodies and minds, and each monad reflected the universe from its own point of view. Each monad mirrored the whole universe. Spinoza uh, had a different way of combining mind and body. He thought that mind and body were two aspects of the same reality, which in, in its largest level he called God or nature, and that there was a material and mental aspect to everything. So right back in the 17th century, very soon after Descartes, we have a kind of panpsychist view, the idea that there's a psyche or soul in all things. 
Um, and in the 20th century, the leading proponent of this was Alfred North Whitehead, one of the great prophetic philosophers who, in my opinion, was years ahead of his time. Whitehead realized that the best metaphor for nature is organisms. Nature is made of organisms, and there are organisms at all levels of complexity, electrons, atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organs, organisms, societies of organisms, uh, ecosystems, solar systems, galaxies. Um, all of these are organisms, and all of them, according to Whitehead, have a mental and a physical pole. And what made the mental and the physical pole different was not so much a spatial difference some people think the mind's the inside, the body's the outside. He didn't use a spatial metaphor. He thought the key difference was in time. That all organisms have a kind of memory given by the influence of their own past and the past of similar systems. Uh, the term, term for this influence he called pre prehension. But uh, they, they also have uh, virtual futures. They also have goals towards which they're moving, purposes. It, there's a teleology, a, a goal-directedness in their behavior. What was original about Whitehead was that he saw there were two different strands of causation. One, the familiar kind pushing from the past. Energy is a kind of cause that works from the past to the present. The other, the mental pole, works as a cause in the opposite direction, from virtual futures back through the present towards the past. So the influence of mind and matter is not inside and outside, it's future and past. The mind inhabits a realm of virtual futures, and from those uh, goals or attractors in those futures, its influence works backwards in time, whereas the energetic movement uh, of regular causation moves forward in time. The two meet in our minds, in our bodies. Our minds are realms of possibility. Our minds hold together many coexisting possibilities. As soon as we make a decision, like coming to the Temenos meeting this evening, um, then of all the possible things we could have done this evening, once we've made that decision, that's what happens. And that's a measurable fact. You know, we're being, we could be photographed and it's a measurable, observable fact. We could be weighed. These are fa the fact we're all in this room is, is an objective fact. Um, but the possibilities from which it emerges are not material. They inhabit this other realm. And it's funnily enough, the same is true of electrons in quantum theory. An electron, as it starts out from a reaction or an atom or something, um, has what's called a wave equation, which includes all the possible things it could do. An electron has, going ahead of it, a kind of cloud of possibility. And one of the paradoxes of quantum theory is that of all those possible things, when it actually interacts with something, or when you measure it, all those possibilities collapse down to one observable fact. It's there, and it's there in that particular position at that particular time. So mind, uh, the realm of mind or possibility um, or goals is non-material and yet um, becomes material facts through a relation in time, as it were. A decision is made and then it becomes an objective, observable fact. Matter is, as it were, in the past, compared with the mental pole of things. Anyway, that's Whitehead's theory. And um, this is still being developed by philosophers in the Whitehead tradition, in the process philosophy tradition. And um, I think it provides a much better way of looking at the nature of matter and mind. We then come to the next dogma. The total amount of matter and energy is always the same. This is something probably all of you learned in school. It's the law of conservation of matter and energy. Um, it seems to me uh, that it seems one of the firmest and most certain facts in science. And for me, uh, although I've questioned many of the dogmas of science, it wasn't until I was writing this book that I questioned this one. I'd never seen that I could question it. I thought this is so certain, such a, a gold-plated truth, that it's unquestionable. I only questioned it because it's clearly a dogma, it's clearly an assumption, um, and I felt for the sake of completion I should include it in this book. Um, and I thought that maybe I'd find that it was in fact completely reliable, utterly the truth, and this might be the one exception to questionable dogmas on which science is founded. 
but I soon found this was the shakiest of them all. It's a house of cards. And um, this, is, um, it, this is a surprise. This was a big surprise for me. I hadn't expected it. When I looked into the history of it, you find that the origins of this dogma are not scientific and empirical, but philosophical and theological. When we question it, is the total amount of matter and energy always the same? We found the reason people think, think this is not because they've measured things to many places of decimals, it's because they start with this assumption. The total amount of matter being the same follows from the materialist assumption dating back to ancient Greece that atoms are unchangeable particles. The atomists or materialists in ancient Greece believed that reality was eternal and it was made up of lots of uh, very small particles of matter. Matter was the eternal reality. It was the one reality and it was eternal. And the atoms, by definition, couldn't be changed. They couldn't be split up. Uh, so the total amount of atoms was always the same. Therefore, the total amount of matter was always the same, at least implicitly. And so when atomism and materialism were adopted by modern science, uh, this uh, assumption was simply carried over. The founders of science thought God created everything in the beginning, but thereafter the total amount of matter, the total number of atoms was the same. God also imparted to the universe at its creation uh, a certain amount of energy, um, motion. Because God endowed the universe with motion, set it going, uh, because the motion was derived from God, the total amount of motion remained the same because it was a divine gift that couldn't be altered. So the reasons for thinking the total amount of matter and energy are always the same were essentially theological and philosophical. These were built into the beginning of science as we know it. People didn't test them, they started off by assuming them. Now physicists are much less constrained than most of us when it comes to these seemingly inviolate principles. In the, uh, 19, uh, in the 1990s, the 80s and 90s, it became clear that conventional theories of physics can't explain the way galaxies are. The stars ought to be hurtling apart, so the galaxies shouldn't be clumping together as if they're attracting each other. There seems to be far more gravity in gra galaxies and in clusters of galaxies than there ought to be allowing for all the stars and planets and things that are there. The whole system holds together far better than it ought to. Now, there was no consideration here, maybe that's because they're organisms that have a kind of coherence. The assumption is it must all be explained by gravity. Uh, there's not enough gravity to explain it, so we'll invent more. And so uh, they hypothesized or invented what's called dark matter um, to explain the way galaxies are. And exactly the amount of dark matter was invented is as needed to balance the equations and make the, the whole system work. So then you say, what is dark matter? The answer is, no one knows. Its nature is literally obscure. And there are many uh, lectures and, and articles and learned journal papers on this subject. Uh, and there's no general agreement as to what it is. But um, the general agreement within physics is that there's at least five times as much dark matter <laughs> as there is matter of the kind we already know. Well, no, no one said you can't invent all that extra dark matter just conjuring it out of nowhere uh, because of the law of conservation of matter. Uh, no, they just invented it, they needed it, they invented it. No one worried about the conservation of matter. And the amount of dark matter changes at will, depending on the needs of these equations and the observations of galaxies. And indeed, they could abolish it, because some people say, well, if we just tweak the laws of gravitation, we could get rid of the need for dark matter. If that happens, then it will all vanish, like the morning mist. Um, so how seriously can we take uh, the conservation of matter when people can invent and possibly even then abolish all this extra matter? And the same goes for energy. Since the year uh, uh, around 2000, it's been clear the universe is expanding too fast. It's expanding faster than it ought to have been. When they invented all the dark matter, it created a problem. There's suddenly all this extra mass in the universe, which meant that the universe is expanding, but all this extra mass should be slowing it down. And uh, people thought that the universe would slow down and stop expanding, and then began to contract until it all uh, uh, accelerated inwards more and more, till it ended in the reverse of the Big Bang, called in the trade the Big Crunch. And so everything was going to end in an ultimate dark hole. But by the end of the 90s, um, 
that idea began to go out and uh, the discovery that the universe is actually, its expansion is accelerating, led to the invention of dark energy, which is supposed to be pushing it apart. And the equations for dark energy that most physicists use say that the energy density of the universe uh, is, has a particular value. Well, density means amount per unit volume, but the universe is expanding, so therefore the amount of energy must be ex expanding as well. The universe is creating more energy as it expands. It's a perpetual motion machine. So now uh, we've reached the stage where on the current estimate 96% of the matter and energy in the universe is dark matter and dark energy. The kinds we actually know about uh, are less than 4% of reality. So how can we be sure that the total amount is conserved? Do we know whether any of these dark matter and dark energies can be converted to regular matter and energy or vice versa? No, we don't. And when people come along with uh, so-called uh, new energy technologies, above unity devices, free energy devices, um, there are many people who claim to have invented devices like this, uh, they're laughed out of court within science. The oldest taboo in science is against perpetual motion machines. And so all these people who come up with inventions, there are quite a lot of them. If you go on the internet and look under above unity devices or free energy devices, you'll find there's a whole world out there of inventors in garages and so on who claim to have discovered things that produce energy, as it were, from thin air. Um, many of them claim they're converting the quantum vacuum energy or uh, the zero-point energy, which is part of contemporary physics, into usable energy. And um, now these would obviously totally transform the world if, if, if you could produce energy uh, for, through these devices. Many of them claim to have working models. Whenever they approach big investors, the big investors immediately ring their scientific advisors and the scientific advisors always say, you know, don't touch it with a barge pole. You know, this is nothing but a, a perpetual motion machine. These people must be cranks. You know, there's a catch somewhere. Don't get involved. Nevertheless, there's one of them, a chap called Rossi, who's uh, got a device that he's marketing at the moment. He's already sold several of these reactors to the U.S. Department of Defense, or at least we it's usually thought the secret buyer is the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, so uh, these things do work. My own approach is that uh, the best, I think the best way to do this would be to have a prize, a large prize, say a million pounds, uh, for above unity devices and simply have a level playing field, evaluate them, see what works, and if any work, they'd get the prize. If none work, then the materialists will be able to say, I told you so. Um, but this time, they'd actually have some evidence in favour of their position instead of it being an assumption. So they ought to welcome this. The situation is even more surprising and perhaps shocking when it comes to the energy in living organisms. It's been assumed since the 19th century that living organisms are completely covered by the laws of conservation of matter and energy. There's no mysterious vital forces, vital energies, chi, prana, all these kinds of things are just fanciful concepts that have no relation to real energy which is defined and totally quantified by physics. That's universally assumed. It wasn't assumed in the early 19th century, though. There was a dispute. Vitalists argued that living organisms had special access to kinds of energy called vital energy that wasn't just the same as ordinary energy. Hermann von Helmholtz, who is mostly remembered for his role in physics, uh, made it his life's work as a young medical student in Berlin uh, and later as a doctor in the Prussian army uh, to refute vitalism in biology and, to, instill, and, and to, to make sure that mechanism, that living organisms was just machines, became the only orthodoxy. To do this, he had to get rid of vital energy. At first, he tried to prove it by measuring the temperature of frogs' legs, which he made contract through uh, electrical impulses. But he, he wanted to show that the amount of temperature and work was the same. Um, but he couldn't do it. He, it didn't work out. It was too, the methods were too crude. So he then proved it theoretically rather than experimentally. Assuming that living organisms are machines, then they must obey the laws that machines obey of conservation of matter and energy, and therefore living organisms are machines. So he had a kind of circular argument proving what he'd set out, to, uh, what he'd assumed to start with. And since then, this became the dogma in biology. It wasn't tested in human beings till 1899. 
And the people who tested it, the foundational evidence for this comes from the classic studies of Atwater and Benedict in the United States, to which if you ask, if you question this dogma, you'll say, oh, well, there are these calorimeter studies that have proved it in humans. Atwater and Benedict um, um, said this in their paper, that the law of conservation of matter applies within the living organism, no one would doubt. It might seem equally certain that the metabolism of energy within the body takes place in accordance with the law of conservation of energy. The quantitative demonstration is, however, desirable. So we know the answer already, we're just going to demonstrate it. And when they did it, they had people in a, a calorimeter. Um, they were sealed in this box, sometimes for days on end, uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, urine, feces, temperature, everything was measured. And they came out with the wrong answer. So they changed, they changed the conversion factors for the calorific value of food to get the right answer. And once they got the right answer, they did more tests. And they found that some people who were fasting and doing exercise were getting more energy than they ought to. Um, others who were doing nothing and eating a lot were getting less than they ought to. There were serious discrepancies. So how did they deal with it? Well, they got just the same number of people with too much and too little, so when they averaged it out, it came out to the right answer. And that's what was in textbooks. It was hailed as the ultimate proof of mechanism, the last nail in the coffin of vitalism. And it was barely examined until the 1970s when an American uh, nutritionist, Paul Webb, looked into it and found huge discrepancies, 25% or so discrepancies, in the amount of energy that was taken in or given out, especially when people were fasting. They seemed to have more energy than they should have done. Um, Webb tried to bring this up in the American Nutritional Society and in the scientific journals. Uh, his papers were published. He was a, a well-accredited scientist. But no one paid the slightest uh, attention because everybody knew that it must be totally conserved within living organisms. And when people came along and talked about prana and chi, everyone knew they were talking rubbish because uh, living organisms and machines. Now, if anyone who believes in prana or chi chooses to question the established dogma and look at the evidence, uh, they'll find it crumbles uh, 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 beneath their fingers. Um, and that's the state of play at present. Well, the next dogma is that the laws and constants of nature are fixed. They were fixed at the moment of the Big Bang. They've always been the same ever since. Um, now, there's a lot of debate within science as to why they were the same, why they were as they were at the Big Bang, because they were all exactly right for life to come about and for humans to emerge and for human minds to operate and for physicists to think about the universe. This is called the anthropic cosmological principle. One school of thought says, well, that means there must have been a kind of engineering mathematical god who fine-tuned them all at the moment uh, uh, before the Big Bang and then pressed the start button. It's a kind of neo-deism. The other school of thought, which is predominant within modern science, is that, um, is that um, we just happen to be in a universe that's right for us. There are billions, quadrillions of actual universes um, and we just happen to be in the one that's right for us. If you say to cosmologists, well, how can you possibly postulate all these extra universes for which there's not a shred of evidence? You say, well, this is the most economical hypothesis. I, I argued with one of our leading cosmologists and, uh, about this, and, uh, and it's, a bit, it's the ultimate violation of Occam's razor, the principle you shouldn't uh, multiply entities unnecessarily. He said, yes, but this way we can get rid of God. Um, <laughs> And so he's prepared to have trillions of universes to get rid of God. Um, yet theologians have already pointed out that actually you don't get rid of God because an infinite God could be the God of an infinite number of universes. So, uh, but nevertheless, the multiverse theory is, is currently orthodox within science without a shred of evidence for it to avoid um, the, the question of why were they all fixed in the particular way. But they all assume they were fixed at the Big Bang there's no evidence at all that they were all fixed at the moment of the Big Bang. It's just an assumption. In an evolutionary universe, why shouldn't the laws evolve? Um, I think they do. In fact, I think they're more like habits. There's a kind of memory in nature. That's my own theory of morphic resonance. 
But I'm not here this evening particularly to talk about my own theory, so I'll concentrate on something that's uh, less personal, um, namely the constants of nature, like the speed of light and the gravitational constant. These are all assumed to be fixed. But if you actually look at the measurements, they don't look very constant at all. The speed of light dropped by about 20 kilometers per second all over the world in the 90, from 1928 to 1945. It was measured in different labs. And they all got very small error bars. And then after about 1945, it went up again all over the world. When I discovered this, I went to discuss it with uh, Dr. Brian Petley, who was head of the National Physical Laboratory, uh, the chief metrologist in Britain, and metrologists are the people who measure these kinds of things. And I asked him about this. I said, how come the speed of light dropped all around the world? Could it really have changed? He said, oh, of course not. It's a constant. Um, so I said, well, then, how do you explain the fact that all over the world these measurements were so much lower? Were people just fudging their results to get what they thought ought to be the right answer? He said, well, we don't like to use that word. So I said, well, what word do you use? He said, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. <laughs> um, um, well, this became, uh, he said, you've discovered the most embarrassing episode in the history of our science. And um, so um, he said, well, anyway, it's not going to happen again. And uh, <laughs> the speed of light was defined by an international committee in 1972. And then they defined the meter in terms of the speed of light. So if it varies, the unit you measure in it would vary too. So it's now a closed system. But in the case of the gravitational constant, there have been rather more variations. Even in the last few years, the gravitational constant, has, the Newton's gravitational constant, big G, um, has um, uh, varied uh, by 1.5%. These are in precision measurements. This is between 1970 and 2010. In top laboratories, the German Institute of Standards, the National Bureau of Standards in Washington, the National Physical Laboratory, there's been this wild fluctuation in, in G. And if you look at the actual measurement, they don't normally publish the exact measurements. What they normally do is publish an average over a time, and then different labs have different values, averages, so they average all those to get the final value of G. When I went to see Dr. Petley after discussing these questions, he reached down behind his desk and he got a cardboard box there. He said, oh, by the way, before you go, you might like a copy of this, and he handed me a pamphlet. He said, the latest value of the physical constants. Um, so um, they've been, they've been fixed and it varies. And if you look at the, um, uh, it, if you look at the um, uh, data from a given lab, this is from the American uh, Bureau of Standards, not very clear, I'm afraid, but this was on different days. And it, the error bars show you the errors. And in different days, um, in 1998, 1999, these values were outside the error bar. of, of, of uh, they, they varied by 1.5% within the same laboratory on different days during the same year. Now, what if G actually varies? It might vary according to the time of year, the Earth's position in relation to the sun. If dark matter really exists, if we go through clouds of dark matter, it would affect the value of G. There could, even within existing physics, there could be good reason for thinking it varies. But this is an unthinkable thought because it's a constant. My proposal is to look at the values of G at different labs around the world on different days and see whether they're correlated. Do they all go up and down together? If they do, we'd learn something. But if we don't look, we won't learn anything. Um, and at present, no one's done that because they're constants. So here's an area, a fairly trivial area, where, um, uh, well, it's not trivial, it's a fundamental constant, but where these dogmas inhibit research quite unnecessarily. Now, um, nature is purposeless becomes the question, is nature purposeless? This, again, is just an assumption. It was made by removing purposes from nature and putting them in divine and human minds. Um, if we look at the way animals and plants behave, they're clearly purposeful, and so are humans. I mean, if nature's purposeless, how come we have purposes? Um, so uh, this is, again, an assumption. It's completely untrue of animals and plants, and in fact, they're now modeled in terms of attractors, which is a term in dynamics uh, which shows how uh, systems in nature are attracted towards an end state that exists in the future. 
if science has actually reinvented teleology, uh, only given it a new name, the attractor. And within biology, people have reinvented purpose in living things by saying that they're genetically programmed to develop, to carry out their instincts. A spider's genetically programmed to spin its web to catch its food. Um, a program is a man-made uh, computer program uh, for a purpose. So it smuggles purpose back into biology. Richard Dawkins' selfish genes do it in another way. Genes are just molecules. They can't be selfish or have desires or mold matter or behave like ruthless Chicago gangsters, to use Dawkins' phrase. Um, these are all projections, quite illegitimate metaphors. And the problem with modern biology is not that it's mechanistic, but that it's crypto-vitalist. Um, it operates in terms of smuggled-in purposes while denying them. And when it comes to the whole of evolution, it's just assumed that the whole of evolution is blind chance and completely purposeless, just chance and natural selection. This is a complete assumption. There's no evidence for it, and it's hard to see how it could ever be proved experimentally. It's a completely open question. I'm fast-forwarding through some of the evidence from biology. All biological inheritance is material. It's in the genes or the DNA. Um, this, again, is a, is, turns out to be a tremendous assumption. Um, it, since the, about 2000, uh, a new kind of material inheritance is recognized, epigenetic inheritance, chemical modifications to genes. Um, but the Human Genome Project, which was supposed to unlock the keys of life and show us exactly what human nature was in, uh, in, um, in chemical terms, has been a terrible damp squib. Hundreds of billions have been lost in biotechnology investments. Genes have been grossly overrated. And we now have within biology a serious crisis, not widely known outside the subject, called the missing heritability problem. It turns out that about 75% of heritability simply can't be explained in terms of genes. Now, I describe in my book the reasons for that. I'm having to accelerate uh, through this because I've got several more delusions to cover and I'm getting down to less than a minute per delusion. Um, but um, I can assure you this is, uh, this is something one can easily justify in terms of known facts and uh, all the data, data in the book. Um, memories are stored as material traces, dogma seven. Your memories are stored inside your brain. Uh, they must be. Where else could they be? Complete assumption, 99.999% of neuroscience is based on this unquestioned assumption. Yet, attempts to find memories in brains have drawn a blank over and over and over again. Uh, some people think they must be stored holographically. Uh, some people think they uh, must be stored in as yet undetermined regions of the brain. We know that the brain's active in laying down memories and in retrieving them, but in between, so-called long-term memory stores have proved elusive, very, very elusive. And I think that's because they're not there. A long time ago, uh, Henri Bergson, the philosopher, uh, based on a tradition that went back uh, to maybe to Plotinus, um, argued that memory was a function of the mind that involved direct connections across time, not storage in space. Memory is a relation in time, not in space. And Bergson and many others have argued that memories are not stored in the brain. Of course, that's never even mentioned within regular biology labs. My own view is that they work by morphic resonance. There's a resonance across time, uh, and that the memories are no more stored in the brain than uh, what you watched on TV last night is stored inside your TV set. Uh, the brain's more like a receiver than a, a video recorder. So it turns out that this assumption is extremely questionable. And uh, when the question, are memories stored as material traces? And you look at the evidence, it's just been a series of frustrations over and over and over again, uh, for more than 100 years, they've been elusive over and over and over again. And I think that's because they're not there. Uh, again, I'm fast-forwarding through some of the evidence. Dogma 8, minds are inside brains. Your mental activity is nothing but the activity of your brain. Therefore, all your mental activity is inside your head. This raises the question of how you see things. Just take a simple thing like vision. Looking around you now, in this room, looking at me, this screen, and so on. Um, where are those images? 
Now, the normal view is that the lights reflected from things, e.g. from me, goes through the electromagnetic field, enters your eyes, inverted images on the retinas, changes in the cone cells, impulses up the optic nerve, various regions of the brain become active. That's all been described in greater detail than ever before. But how do you actually see? First of all, no explanation for consciousness. And secondly, um, all this is inside the brain, and your mind's meant to be inside the brain. So your image of me and of this room ought to be inside your head. When you look at the sky at night or in the day, uh, the sky you're seeing should be inside your head. A recent paper in the journal Behavioral and Brain Sciences asked the question, is your skull beyond the sky? Uh, and the, answer, the author, a materialist, said yes. All our experience is inside our head. So uh, when you see me here now, there's a little Rupert somewhere inside your head. Uh, your seeming head is a simple uh, virtual construct, but your skull is outside everything you're experiencing. That's the official view. There's an alternative view, so simple it's hard to grasp, which is that your images are located where they seem to be outside your head, exactly as they seem to be. Your image of me is located here. It's in your mind, but it's not in your brain. This is now an active question, an active discussion within philosophy of mind. This is called radical externalism. That's one name for this view. Uh, my own view is simply that this vision's a two-way process. We project the images out. Our minds reach out to touch what we're looking at. And I think we can affect things by looking at them, which is why when you look at someone from behind, they can sometimes feel it. There's a sense of being stared at. Now, this is a subject that's been totally taboo within science, and yet there's good experimental evidence now that this really happens. I discuss it in this book, and in more detail in my book, the sense of being stared at and other aspects of the extended mind. So, the idea that minds are inside heads, when you ask the question, are minds confined to heads, the evidence is non-existence. It's simply an assumption. It violates our most immediate experience. Dogma 9 follows from Dogma 8. Psychic phenomena are illusory. All educated people know that they're supposed to deny the existence of telepathy and psychic phenomena because to admit them shows that you're uneducated, stupid, and superstitious. This is a post-enlightenment uh, mental uh, attitude. It's maintained as a social taboo in our society by the fact that serious programs on the BBC and in serious newspapers won't treat uh, research on telepathy seriously. Uh, if it's reported at all, there's always a skeptic there to deny it. Um, whereas it is treated seriously in the Daily Mail and uh, the lower part of the uh, tabloid spectrum. Uh, and that reinforces the prejudice. Oh, well, these uneducated people or stupid people believe that kind of stuff, but we're smart enough to know it's all an illusion. Now, people have been doing research on this for over 100 years, and there's now overwhelming evidence that dogs can be telepathic, knowing when their owners are coming home. I wrote a whole book on that. Um, animals can be telepathic with each other and with people. Many people who keep pets have noticed their pets can pick up their intentions and people can be telepathic with each other. The most common form in the modern world is telephone telepathy, where you think of someone who then rings. It's not just coincidence and you're forgetting all the people you thought of who didn't ring. Uh, detailed tests, um, these are some of my own research, um, show that uh, most people have had, these are surveys showing the frequency of telepathic experiences in, in surveys. Uh, telephone telepathy, um, oh, well, anyway, on the left, telephone telepathy in women and men, women blue, men red, um, it's very, very common. Other kinds of telepathy are still quite common, but not quite as common as telephone telepathy. Um, in my experiments, you, the subject has four callers. They choose four people they know well. Uh, they sit at home being filmed with a landline phone, no caller ID system. We pick one of the four callers at random, ask them to ring the person. The phone rings. They have to guess who it is before they pick it up. I think it's Mary. Pick it up. Hello, Mary. They're right or they're wrong. By chance, they'd be right one time in four, 25%. Uh, that's the chance level on the left. The actual value is 45%. Um, this is highly significant with hundreds of tests. And if two of the callers are strangers on the left, or familiar people on the right, 
um, it works far, far better with familiar people. Telepathy is to do with social bonds between people and people. It's an aspect of the field of social groups. Uh, that's my own theory. I'm just going through this extremely fast. But um, um, essentially, uh, there's now been quite a bit of research. It's been independently replicated. Telephone telepathy seems to be real. And you can do a uh, telephone telepathy test yourself on mobile phones by going to my website, to the online experiments portal, and have a go, try it for yourself. Hundreds of people are doing these tests now, and it escaped from laboratories into the actual world. And um, there's a lot of interest in this among Google and uh, new media companies. Finally, mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. We've all come across this. It's the basis of the fact that the Government Medical Research Council allocates 100% of its research funding to mechanistic medicine and 0% to any other kind uh, because this is the only kind that really works, because it's the only kind that's scientific. Of course, all medical systems, you know, acupuncture, homeopathy, um, Chinese traditional medicine and so on, all of them claim cures. Um, but uh, the official view, would, but that's just because of the placebo effect or they would have got better anyway. The placebo effect itself, though, has to be acknowledged. It's in the heart of medicine at the moment. It's part of standard medical testing. It shows the mind or the belief in the mind affects the healing in the body. That ought not to happen if the mind's nothing but the brain. So the placebo effect in itself undermines this assumption of mechanistic medicine. And this is the assumption that has the most consequences in the everyday world, not least uh, by making sure that official medicine is very, very expensive. Um, my own view is that if we ask this question, is mechanistic medicine the only kind that really works, we find the answer to that is no. Other kinds work too, and what we should do is find out what works and how well it works for different conditions. I think we could have a cheaper and more effective medical system. So, in conclusion, what I'm saying is that the ten dogmas of science um, of materialistic science are all highly questionable. When you question them, when you look at the evidence, which I've only skated through extremely rapidly this evening, um, it turns out that new scientific questions arise in every one of these categories. New questions, new lines of research, new possibilities, which would still be scientific. In fact, they'd be more scientific. They'd also be cheaper, because holistic research is cheaper than reductionist research. To try and find the Higgs boson, you need tens of billions of euros and a large hadron collider. Uh, but to study the behavior of animals or people at their own level, you, you don't need very much. Uh, notebooks, clipboards, and so forth. It can be much, much cheaper. So I think a much better, more effective, more interesting, and more fun kind of science is perfectly possible. And what we need to do is dissolve or go beyond or question scientifically um, the assumptions on which science itself is based. And I think this is in accordance with science, and I think science will be much the better for it. Thank you. Well, uh, Rupert, thank you very much indeed for that uh, very stimulating uh, hour, which seems to have flown by. Whenever I hear Rupert talk, I always feel as if I've gone down the, 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 the hole that Alice went down, and you're following this fantastic rabbit through this world, which becomes ever more plausible and more sensible as you, uh, as you listen to what he's uh, been talking about. Um, how fascinating to just uh, uh, look at what is presumed and... Um, and, and realise there are holes in these in these arguments. Um, of course, uh, we've got a bit of time. I'm not going to waste too much time saying too much uh, because you presumably have some questions to ask of uh, Rupert. We have a microphone here, so if uh, you'd like to put your hands up, uh, uh, please feel free to ask a question. Hey, I just wanted to ask if. The delusions are so easily questioned. Why? You th I mean, I, I agree with you, but why do you think there's been so little of that questioning happening over the last hundred years? I think the reason they've been so little questioned is that scientists intimidate everybody else into thinking they can't question it because they'd be sh shown up as stupid or ignorant. And if you look at the put-downs that scientists like to use when people do question it, 
It's usually withering contempt, and they can make people feel very small and very stupid. Richard Dawkins is the master of this technique, but he's not alone. It's a standard technique. And when I first started questioning myself, um, because I'm a qualified scientist and knew the literature, um, they weren't, they, people did try that on me. They'd say, oh, well, if you think there's anything wrong with the you know, current theories of inheritance, you, know, that just, you haven't read the latest paper in Nature. It came out yesterday. I've just seen a preprint. And uh, you know, that kind of one-upmanship is used by scientists themselves. Well, I read Nature every week and New Scientist in lots of journals, and I try to keep up. And usually uh, they're talking nonsense. They're usually claiming far more for these things than they can. So I can defend myself, but most people can't. And when it comes to, um, say, where most people are aware of the controversies are in relation to psychic phenomena or medicine. If most people say, well, I've had a telepathic experience, the usual response is, oh, well, it's just coincidence, or in any case, there's no evidence for them. They've been scientifically tested, and there's no evidence. It's simply not true. The evidence strongly favors them. But there's, um, it's the put-down and this use of a kind of arrogant dismissal which has been used all these years and it's extremely effective. The other thing is that, as I say, that any educated person wants to seem smart and these things are treated as superstitions. So if you believe these things, it just shows you haven't been educated enough because ordinary people believe these, the kinds of these things like telepathy and so on. Educated people don't. So it's a whole system of sociological forces, taboos, uh, taboos being maintained by active vigilante groups. There are sceptic organizations um, who uh, are, are the active vigilantes who search out heresy and try to destroy it or discredit it. Uh, so there's been a, a concerted endeavor to maintain this worldview, and it's been very, very effective. Yes, please. A microphone. Are you considered a heretic then? Yes. Science is based on the idea there's one truth and science knows it. And that's why anyone who has dissenting views in science is immediately branded a heretic. Now, I'm an Anglican. I go to church on a regular basis. And I, hard, I don't think I've ever heard the word heretic used in a religious context. I hear it all the time in the context of science. Um, because within the realm of religion, people are aware there are different religions, there are different schools of thought within each religion, there are different interpretations of theology. There's a pluralism. But in science there's no pluralism. The ideal of science from the 17th century was that religions quarrel with each other. Science was born at the time of the Thirty Years' War. Religions just quarrel with Protestants, Catholics, it's all just opinion, demagogues and stuff. We've risen above it. We know the truth. The truth is the mathematical laws of nature that are the final, ultimate ideas in the mind of God, and we're privileged to know them. So you don't need two sets of laws of nature. There can only be one. There's originally only one God with one lot of laws. So built into science is a kind of a, a, a culture which has unconsciously modeled itself on the Roman church before the Reformation. Um, and uh, that means that alternative views are simply not tolerated except within fairly narrow limits. Um, and that's why scientists so often use the word heretic, whereas in any other sphere, different views in politics, you know, the Labour aren't heretics just because they're in opposition and uh, in, in, in a court of law. The prosecution or the defence aren't heretics for disagreeing with the other side. But in science, the orthodoxy is maintained by the peer review system, the grant-giving system, the structure of authority, and the fact that textbooks in science are the same all the world over, in India, China, South America, Africa, it's the same, and it's the same orthodoxy. And any deviation from it is punished by, you know, at, at the very least, not getting your grant renewed or failing your exams or whatever. Yes, sir. Is there a, a scientific explanation for the resistance um, to these new ideas um, that makes you seen as a heretic? Um, can you see, is, is, is there's obviously a force mm. that doesn't want your ideas to come to the fore. I'm just wondering if, you've, if, if that's part of your scientific thinking too. Well, my own views on morphic resonance is that nature, including human nature, is largely governed by habits. 
And I think that what are called paradigms in science, models of reality, are really habits of thinking. They're collective habits of thinking. Um, and so I think what one's up against really is the force of habit. But it's a force of habit in this case which is reinforced by a particular worldview. People who are materialists are usually atheists, or at least agnostics, because materialism itself is atheistic. Um, there's nothing but matter. Um, so uh, many of them have rejected religion because they feel that they've risen above it. People who believe in religion are feeble-minded, stupid, deluded, uh, They've been, uh, they've been priests have somehow uh, got, got at them too young and that kind of thing. Uh, but they've seen through it all and risen above it. And so it's associated with an atmosphere of ineffable superiority that uh, science confers and science is so powerful it gives us jet planes, Apple computers and so forth must be right. Um, so this whole world view is, is, is um, one that makes challenging this seem almost impossible. I mean, if you say there's anything wrong with it, they say, well, you know, why didn't you go back to medieval incantations? You know, computers work. So if that kind of rather unthinking and unreflective attitude uh, seems to reinforce this worldview. And I think that's why there's such extremely deep resistance to it. But among people who are devotees of scientism, most people in the population are not. And when I did my research on dogs that know when their owners are coming home, I found that most people are perfectly happy to accept that dogs and cats have powers that can pick up our thoughts. Even many scientists. I mean, many scientists have dogs or cats that know when they're coming home from the lab. But the difference between most people and scientists is that most people don't feel too bad about talking about it with their family and friends. But scientists don't feel too bad about talking about it with their family and friends. When they get to the lab, they'll shut up. They won't mention it because they'll be ridiculed or fear they will be. Science is full of people who've, had, who've got psychic pets or have had telepathic experiences or have been to alternative therapists, but they can't mention it to people at work for fear uh, that they'll be thought odd. I think what will really change science is something analogous to the gay liberation movement when people come out. And science, is, <laughs> science is full of closet holists and, and uh, people with uh, telepathic experiences. And I feel when they feel free to say that and talk to their colleagues, they'll find that most of their colleagues, the most of them, um, share those interests. There's a minority, a highly strident minority, uh, of militant atheists and dogmatic materialists. Uh, but they do not speak for the whole scientific community. And whenever surveys have been done on scientists' actual attitudes, very few of them actually really believe in this, in this dogmatic <laughs> worldview. They just pretend to when they're at work. And I think it's rather similar in science today uh, to Russia under Brezhnev, when you know, people who, uh, in public, questioned dialectical materialism and communist principles, uh, you know, ran a severe risk of having their careers judder to a halt. But in private, how many actually believed it? And I think we have that situation today within science. <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Next. <laughs> um, as someone who doesn't know, uh, and if it's not off topic, uh, um, is there a significant difference between DNA in human beings and DNA in apes? Yes, the difference is about 1%. Chimpanzees, as revealed through the Chimpanzee uh, Genome Project, are about 99% identical to us, and most of their proteins are extremely similar too. And when the chimpanzee genome had been fully sequenced, uh, it was after the human genome, the head of the genome, uh, the chimp genome project, uh, admitted uh, that we can't see in this why we're so different from chimps. So um, it, we're, the other thing, the human genome project was a huge shock because people thought there'd be about 100,000 genes and they were going to be able to patent them all and make a fortune. We've only got about 23,000 genes a sea urchin has about 26,000, a fruit fly 17,000, rice plants about 38,000. Um, there's no obvious correlation between our genes and what we are. Um, the person who discusses this most clearly is James Lefanu in his book, Why Us? Um, 
It was a huge shock, the Genome Project, because it didn't show what people had expected. And it's gone, it's, it's, things have got worse, not better. As I mentioned, the missing heritability problem is now a huge embarrassment in the heart of science. Very few scientists talk in public about it because they, you know, they want everyone to believe that they're on track to discover all these new medicines, new drugs and stuff by more genetic analysis. My question, question concerns the unknowable in relation to what used to be uh, referred to as the ineffable. Um, when your first book came out, I was a sort of 18th century agnostic come atheist, and um, I'm very grateful for the fact that uh, that and some of the volumes that followed actually not changed my life, but changed my attitude uh, in my experience of to men praying to formation dancing as far as I've dabbled in them. But um, I've increasingly come to this conviction that contrary to what uh, contemporary science would uh, insist, uh, in fact it's not really founded on a rationality and uh, logic a root. Uh, Wilbur in one of his early volumes um, says if, if, if I ask a scientist to show me a piece of matter, or a piece of space, or a piece of time, a piece of energy, he cannot actually do so. You know, he well, points to the, that chair there. You know, that, that's not a piece of matter, that's, that's a chair. <laughs> um, I juxtaposed that with uh, something I noticed in what I consider as bibliomania, be the most subversive volume that I have, and it's the Macmillan Dictionary of History of Science, uh, which the uh, principal editor was uh, the late Roy Porter, and in there it's revealed that um, the word scientist having been uh, coined in Birmingham in 1833, I think it was, yes. some decades later uh, in the Chinese, or the, the group of, of languages of which Chinese is one, so Korean and uh, Japanese, they had to come up with a word for science. And uh, the word that they, they use in those countries, if you translate it back literally into English, it actually uh, means correlational studies, which has struck me as actually far more consistent with what, <laughs> with, with what science actually entails, and particularly mm. technology. So, so what's, what's your question? Sorry. So my, my question is, um, um, you, your first sentence this evening but was, if I recall, the delusion, you characterized the delusion um, as that the, the, the science understands the, the, the nature of the, u the universe in principle. My question is, do you consider, in view of what I've just said, that it will ever be possible to understand the nature of the universe? Well, no. I think that it can understand it within limited areas. Um, for one thing, to be a scientist or to just be a human being, you have to be conscious. Um, so, can you understand the nature of human consciousness by studying matter or material or natural systems? Um, I don't think so. I think you can only stand, understand consciousness by experiencing it. So I don't think there's any way we'll ever have a kind of external understanding of consciousness. We presuppose consciousness to do science, so science can't really explain what it presupposes. Um, so, um, and uh, it's clear that in traditions, especially the Hindu and Buddhist tradition, people have explored consciousness over very long periods in very much greater depth than anyone has in the West, um, except perhaps some of the greater Christian mystics. Um, and that if we want to understand what consciousness is like and what it's about, we have to look there, not at studies on brain activity, which uh, would, can at best have a correlation with conscious states. Um, so I think there's always things that science can't explain. Basically, it explains regularities. It's a system that explains the regularities of nature. It can't explain creativity, because creativity by its nature isn't regular. It's something unpredictable by definition. So creativity, consciousness, why anything's here at all, um, uh, all these kinds of questions are not really within the purview of science. Uh, science is a, a, a works in a limited area, and this has always been understood, that there's science is within the realm of metaphysics, which are the assumptions that affect science. And metaphysics 
um, fills within a larger context of theology or uh, higher realms of philosophy, which are to do with ultimate questions that science doesn't really address. I think we're going to have to draw a close there. And perhaps um, <clears throat> with that uh, comment about the, the mysteries of consciousness, that's a good place to stop. <laughs> we, from what I can understand of what Terence Rupert has been saying, that really is still the taboo of science, and maybe that's where science needs to go, to properly open its, uh, its own mind. Thank you very much indeed for coming this evening. I hope you found it inspiring. Um, I'm sure you'll find much more in Rupert's book, which I would really encourage you uh, to read. It is a book very much for our time. Rupert, thank you very much. Thank you.